many of us don't know one another. Why don't we start with you? I am Yuba. Sophia. Ravi. Vinayak. Trevor. Anand. Brad. No. Okay. Okay. Jim. So. Is this being recorded? Yes, it okay. is. This is uh, the 16th chapter. We basically just started it. So, is there someone here? No. Oh, just looking for a pillow. Um, if we need more pillows, I have some in the bedroom as well. Anyway, um, so this is a difficult chapter for some people. It's called Divine and Devilish Estates. And we have at the beginning a list of some character assets. Okay. And then we have a long list of character defects, some kleshas, some afflictions, some doshas. Krishna says, Arjuna, you have these divine aspects. You're cool. You're fine. You're going to get realized. Other people, trash. So how do we use this? It's not something that many people find of value without some insight. So I want to talk a bit about one of the effects of meditation. In meditation, <coughs> It's not about superimposing some salve on my ulcerated mind. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. I frequently will say, just don't do something, sit there. And what happens when we quit fussing with the mind? Out of the unconscious, the Hridaya Granti, the knots of the heart start to bubble up. This process is called Kashaya, the vomiting up of the unconscious tendencies of the mind. The best parallel I can draw to it, if any of you have done any deep tissue body work. Anybody done any of that? So the difference between that and say a Swedish massage, you go through a Swedish massage, oh, that feels so good. But if you're doing deep tissue, uh, uh, the therapist will be say working on your leg and they find a knot, then what do they do? You, what they do for you? Press harder. And then what happens? It hurts. You scream. Ah! Now, is the therapist hurting you or is the pain already in your body? Oh, is that a question? Yes. I'm, it's probably there. Your pain is already in your body. In fact, it's some stored trauma experience physical issues, something like that. What the therapist is doing is letting it out. Does that make sense? It's like rolfing. Anybody ever been rolfed? That's a really heavy deep tissue work. Meditation is rolfing your mind. That's what we're doing. We're creating an environment for all those issues to come to the surface. We're making the unconscious conscious. And out of the unconscious come these knots of the heart into our field of awareness. And just don't do something sit there and then they start to loosen and the knot sometime we get some freedom so meditation is more like lancing a boil 
than it is about superimposing aloe vera on myself. You see the difference? Paradoxically, if in your meditation it's a struggle and your mind is really noisy and all of a sudden blah, 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 what's going on or fear is coming up or anger is coming up or a deep resentment at something or you remember some issue from childhood. These are the ones that are doing the most good, even though they may be the most uncomfortable. Just don't do something. Sit there. Now, what do most of us do? Oh, I'm just not into it today. I just, I just, so I go eat something. I get on Netflix. I go to work. I get productive, stuff like that. So I push those kleshas back down into the other conscious. Is this making sense to you? Anybody have questions about it? Because many of us come to meditation, oh, I'm such a mess, I wanna get some peace, you know. Ooh, peace, I want some peace. Thinking again, some are gonna play music and smoke a little dope, but that'll give me peace. No, it doesn't work that way. Underneath your essential nature is Paramashanti, supreme peace. That other stuff has to come up. So, go ahead. Um, when this was discovered, there were far fewer easy ways to distract yourself that were as pleasant or as distracting. Oh, not at all. This is what I want. This is what I'm asking. Yeah. Tell me why I'm not. Because sex is the big one. Okay. <laughs> and, and self esteem and the fascination and uh, 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 obsession with what other people think about you. So sex and gossip. Uh, we can go on, but anyway, there's about six ideas that the whole mind is held together with. And it hadn't changed, because people don't change. You know, we just dress it up with different costumes. That's all. So, I don't know if that's used. Yeah, the human condition and stuff. Yeah. 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 But we find some way to not be attentive to what it is. So I like to frame this chapter with the first sutra of the second chapter of Yoga Sutra. Yoga Sutra is a wonderful text. And the first sutra of the second chapter is Tapa Swadhyayeshwara Pranidhana Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga, yoga in action, the doing of yoga. Three things. Tapas, usually translated as austerity. Swadhyaya. The outer meaning of Swadhyaya is our own study of scripture. Another meaning of it, because it literally means self-study, is the capacity to have an understanding of our own psychological material. These kleshas and doshas. And we don't do the inventories all in ready. We also need to be very clear about what our strengths are as well. And then Ishwara Pranidhana, trustful surrender to the Lord. What is tapas? The exoteric, the outer meaning is I do something like I fast on Fridays. It's Shivaratri, I'm going to stay up all night. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with these kinds of tapas. But the deeper meaning of tapas, which literally just means heat, the mind runs in certain habituated channels. These sankalpas, these sanskaras, these vasanas. 
and many of them are self-destructive. If someone criticizes you, do you go into all sorts of why do you do like that? Or do you have massive control issues? Or are you obsessed with the fear of financial insecurity? Are you obsessed with what other people think of you? Are you obsessed with what your body image is? That's a big one in this day and age. Whatever it is, whatever it is, we want to turn our mind away from these habituated movements of thought into more constructive. You know, some of us now we do a family of origin and stuff, adult children of alcoholics work. And you do all this work and you find out why you're a basket case. But then what do you do with that? Ultimately, we have to do tapas. We have to move the mind from these habituated modes of thinking into more constructive ones. Thought and action replace. Does this make sense? This is us. It is far more useful to have the discipline, okay, I'm gonna give up gossiping at work than to stay up. <coughs> It is far more useful to guard your speech. And I'm not going to criticize other people than to fast on a Friday. I love what the Master Jesus said. He said, We are defiled not so much by what we put into our mouth, but by what comes out. This is a meaning speech, not there, not that. <laughs> so this is the process of tapas, which becomes fruitful only with the self-examination. These inventory processes. This is swadhyaya. Now. If you've had a really bad habit and worked really hard, how many of you have ever found that you're pretty powerless to change some mode of thinking or some behavior pattern? This is why we need Ishwara. These things are only possible. With God's help, ultimately, with the grace of God. Some of us are very disciplined, and we can work on these things through our own purusharta, our own self effort. Others of us, like me, I have a rebel mind, an outlaw, outlaw mind. I set my mind to do one particular thing, and then bang, it does exactly the opposite. Am I the only one in the room with a mind like that? So for minds like mine, I have to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. I don't try to fix myself and solve my problems. I give them to God. Now there's a balance here. I think I said this a couple of weeks ago. The great Catholic saint, St. Augustine of Hippo, said, pray like it all depends on God, work like it all depends on you. So we cooperate with grace. So how do I know what are character assets, my strengths, 
And what are my clashes, my afflictions? So in this chapter, we get a guide to this inventory process. So we've gone through many of the character assets, things we want to cultivate. Kindness, forwardness, truthfulness, generosity, the whole list of them. So I think now we're going to move into the character defects we want to become aware of. Now, understand that few of, yeah, I've never met a person who is all divya, all divine, or all asura, all divine. Most of us have them. Any thoughts on the process? Okay, Ravi, will you help us out? Sure. Nice and loud because we want the Zoom people to hear. We are on verse five. Verse five. Okay. They we sun some mokshaya nibanda daya suri mata mashucha sampadam devi mabijato si pandava. One more? No, and then the English, please. Yes. The divine nature is deemed for liberation. The, the Dem de demoniacal or bondage. Demoniacal, I would Demoniacal, pronounce. Demoniacal or bondage. Grieve not, O Pandava. You are born with divine qualities. Yeah, so he gives he gives Arjun a pass here. You're fine. Don't worry about it. But again, most of us have some of the divine qualities and some of the Going on, please. Uh, is fearlessness one of the divine qualities? It is. But at the beginning of this text, he's fearful. Is he not? Is he completely clouded by fear? Well, maybe, maybe um, the demand for consistency is Asia. <laughs> What are the other divine qualities? Yeah, well, I don't want to review all the first four uh, verses. Okay. We've spent weeks on them. But do you have a copy of the text? No. We need to get you one. We need to get you one. You can, you can read them. Yep. Okay. All right. Next one, please. Sixth one? Yes. <clears throat> Dobuta Sango Dobuta Sargo Loke Smin. They were Asura Avacha. They were Vista Russia her Prokta Asuram Partha Meshunu. There are two types of beings in this world the divine and the demoniac. The divine have been described at length. <laughs> Demoniacal. How do you pronounce it? Demoniacal or Demoniac. a demoniac? Demoniacal. Okay. Is that it? That's it. It's just saying. Read it again. There are two types of beings in this world the divine and the demoniacal. The divine have been described at length. Hear from me, O part of the demoniac. Yes. So again, this is the exoteric meaning. You're either this or you're that. In actuality, most of us are a combination. But what we want to do as we get into the demoniacal traits is this is a list for you to check out. Okay. Am I this way? Some of now, let me give you a secret on how to use these things. 
when we get these great big huge lists, it's impossible to tackle all these practices all at once. So what I would recommend is let's say you have the word again that we have in, in Sanskrit, we've got two of them, klesha, an affliction, or dosha, a defect, uh, a character defect. If you've raised Christian, uh, we would use the word sin. By the way, I'm going to give you a good definition of sin. In Sanskrit, the word is papa which basically means ritual impurity. But here's a deeper definition of a sin. Anything that we do, gross or subtle, meaning an action or a thought, that grossifies, that thickens the mind is a sin. Anything that we do that brings us more clarity, more peace, that is punya, merit. Another definition. A sin is anything that separates us from the love of God or the love of our fellow human beings. So this shifts things. So if you're a Brahmin, and you touch a chandala. Is that a sin? Some would say that it is. <clears throat> I would say self centered fear is far more destructive to your mind. If you're a Catholic and you Eat meat on a Friday. Is that a sin? Some would say. I would say deeply held resentment is much worse. So look at those two things rather than moral or ritual behaviors. Does it separate you from the love of God or the love of other people? Does it grossify my mind? Does it make it thicker, denser? Or does it cultivate sattva? Any questions on this? Why would you say that if the resentment is worse than eating meat? Well, resentment becomes a stain on your soul. Resentment is a poison we brew for another and drink ourselves. If you hang on to deeply held resentment, you're probably going to make yourself sick and you for sure will make yourself miserable. It doesn't do a thing to the other person. Yeah, but then when you eat meat, you're taking the life of another. Okay, meat. maybe I should have used a different example. Maybe the part that's missing is that Catholics aren't allowed to eat on Fridays, but they can eat it every other time. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so it's a it's a rule about when it's, to eat. It's a it's a rule when when as a thank you. Okay, I thought it was like a vegetarian. No, 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 no. In 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 the Catholic tradition, fasting means you don't eat flesh. So uh, what I'm saying is dietary rules are not nearly as efficacious for us. And these deeper understandings, <laughs> top us of the austerities we are practicing. Thank you for focusing on that. Okay, so going on. Now we're going to begin our list of character defects. Oh, the thing I wanted to say if as we go through these, this list, you see, well, okay, I have this to some degree, or I have that to some degree, don't try to work on all of it all at once. Just pick one of them. Let's say um, let's say you have a, a, a plasia of control issues. 
that's when it's effective. I joke with people. I'm a blind backseat driver with a poor sense of direction. Shouldn't you get off of this off ramp? But it also is other areas of my life. Long, old, gnarly, rusty. No, it doesn't look true to me. Because I laugh at it now. And I rarely act or speak. But we get to make friends with these patients and work on them. All right, next verse. Dobritim cha nibritim cha janana vidura sura na shaucham na pichacha ro na satyam te shu vidyate. The demoniac knows not what to do and what to refrain from. Neither purity nor right conduct nor truth is found in them. Yes, so the results of people who are deeply stained by these character defects, they live life deep in ignorance. They don't know what is going to make them happy. Um, I can remember the people in the news announcing soon after the former president was elected that he was with his cabinet and he said to them, your job on a daily basis is to assist me in vanquishing my enemies. It's a very interesting view of the world. I'm not sure he knew. That's probably going to make him pretty unhappy. But we do these things. We engage in behaviors that in fact do not help us. Another one I hear all the time. Oh, I'm not speaking to so-and-so. Why not? Well, they hurt me. So I'm setting a healthy boundary. I'm not speaking to them anymore. Is that working out for you? That bringing love? And reconciliation in your life? Oh, I heard a good one the other day. Ego, E-G-O, edging God out. That's what we do. So, if one is consumed with these demoniacal traits, there's no God in heaven that's going to punish you for this. We are not punished for our sins. We are punished by our sins. If you go out and get drunk Friday night on cheap champagne, and you wake up Saturday morning with a headache, no God is punishing you with a hangover. You're getting the inevitable results. Of being stupid. You see that? You see that? So the result, the, the, the payoff for these patients, these afflictions, is unhappiness. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. The only thought I've had is that um, <clears throat> it sounds like we make ourselves unhappy, despite often thinking that others are doing 
by and large, our misery is self-created, almost always. I'll give you some axioms. Nobody has the power to make me feel anything. Once I understand that, what is that power? I decide how I'm going to feel about their behavior or their speech. Another one. It's a spiritual axiom that if I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, I'm the one with the attachment, the expectation, the identification, the clincher. Don't I have a right to be upset if I'm cheated? Yes, the people in this world are oftentimes quite wrong. But you and I don't have to get upset about it. Since it's a choice. If we believe they have all the power and I am a victim, fine. But there's no chance for you to really get any peace because guess what? You can't really change other people. Yoga Vasishta says this wonderful thing. Why try to cover the world in leather when you can wear shoes? So what the scripture is saying here, if we're caught up in these destructive modes of thinking and acting, the end result is our own misery. Going on, next verse, please. Asatya mapratishtam te jagadahura nishwaram saparas parasam bhutam kiman yakama hai tukam. They say the universe is without truth, without moral basis, without a god, not brought about by any regular causal sequence, with lust for its cause. What else? So the word is karma. Craving for its cause is, I think, better than lust. I don't know why Swamiji translated it that way. But the whole idea is those of us, I don't think any of you are in this uh, mode, but we may know people who are, who are complete moral uh, uh, secularists, who have no moral center per se. I can remember back in 2008 and nine, there was a movie that came out about the crash of the, 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 uh, the market because of the junk uh, mortgages that were bundled. What was that movie called? The Big Short. Yes, yes. And it just amazed me that these people knowing that they were harming people, but they didn't care. Their own greed was more important to them. And there are people who live in the world with no ethical compass. Now, what's the difference between morality and ethics? This is my definition. Morality comes from the Latin more, which means custom. These are largely external and society based. But because at the deepest level, we are all one. There's something in us that intuitively has a very clear ethical center. It's kind of like this. If I cut my thumb accidentally while I'm chopping vegetables, I don't go, bad thumb. 
You're a terrible fuck. I go, no. Why? Because I, as an eagle, pervade all of my body. I pervade the thumb. I pervade the nose and the toes. Likewise, for the person of this who knows I'm going I have done <laughs> That's not another person over there. That's myself. I understand their suffering because I understand my own. And this identification becomes the doorway to a natural kind of compassion that doesn't come out of some moral idea. Oh, I should be compassionate because I'm going to have to fight you. But there are people who do not know this. And they live a life of harming others. In the end, it harms ourselves. Any thoughts on this? Next verse. Etam etam krishtam avastabhya nashtatmano manolpa buddhaya prabhavantya grak sorry prabhavantyu gram karmanah shayaya jagato hitaha Shall I repeat it once more? If you wish. Etam krishtam Mavastabhya Ashtatmanol Pabuddhaya Prabhavantya Krutya Yugra Karmanaha Chaya Jagato Hitaha. Holding this view, these ruined souls of small intellect and fierce deeds come forth as the enemies of the world for its destruction. So if you go into nature, actually, it's a pretty groovy world out there. Yes, tigers do eat deer. Big fish eat little fish. But by and large, it's pretty balanced. The vast majority of the suffering of the imbalance, tribulation, the war, the famine, and all this stuff. We've done it to ourselves. A dog can only do its dog thing. A bear can only do its bear thing. But we human beings have the capacity to ignore this instinctual connection with others. And we're taught to be greedy and selfish, fear. I'm saying it doesn't occur in the end. But we have it in spades. We have it in spades. There's likely to be a food shortage in Africa coming up. Not from lack of food. It's sitting there rotten in Ukraine. People are doing crazy things. Just making sense. So the people who live from this demonic, demoniacal like not me doing it, not me, <laughs> uh, mode of life that karma, craving, desires, what it's all about. Give me mine. 
And this becomes the cause of so much suffering, not only for that person, but for the world itself. Going on. Kama Mashita Shitya Dushpuram Dambhamana Madan Vitaha Moha Guhitva Sagraha Grahan Kavartante Shuchitrataha Filled with insatiable desires, full of hypocrisy, pride and arrogance, hold, holding evil ideas through delusion. They work with impure resolves. So let's talk about these two ways of trying to find happiness. Bhoga and yoga. A person who practices bhoga is called a bogi. A person who practices yoga a yogi. Both bogies and yogis seek happiness. A bogi endeavors to find happiness by satisfying as many desires as possible. What they don't realize is the mind sets up this attachment and craving. Swamiji used to say, if sex were satisfied, we'd only do it once. And it's the same with money and food and prestige and applause. Most of you are too young to remember the great singer Judy Garland. Anybody ever see her? Yep. Live? No. But you've seen film of her. Absolutely incredible artist. She just thrived on the applause. She never felt she was lovable. Incredibly tragic woman, basically died of drug addiction. So getting fame, getting applause, getting money didn't make her happy. Now, there's nothing wrong with money or fame or applause. It just won't make you happy. That's all apples and oranges. Getting what you want simply gets you what you want. And if we're attached to it, it becomes the cause of my sorrow. Because when I dance with an object, egoistically, desire and object of desire become one. Man, that was a great widget. Some person, place, thing, or situation. That's where the juice is. It leaves an impression in my unconscious and makes me want to appear. That impression is called a vasana. Now, you have direct experience of vasana pressure. Who here has ever sat down in meditation and you're just antsy? And then you think, oh, this, I'm just not, this isn't the right time. And then you get up, well, do I want to eat something? Do I want to do the laundry? Do I have some project at work? Do I want to, you know, play with my computer? Who's had that feeling? You keep looking for something to fix the feeling of being restless and discontent. That restlessness, that discontent is a spiritual hangover. It's the result of 
yesterday's indiscriminate revelry with the object of the senses. All of those vasanas are in there. Press them up, press them up. Do this, do that. Go for this, go for that. And they tyrannize us. They tyrannize Oh, I'm so exhausted. Oh, I was just busy all day. How come? I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. The yogi also seeks happiness, but she seeks happiness by engaging in a way of life that reduces the number of desires and attainments. What's left is the peace, your own self nature. Doesn't mean we don't engage in the world. We'll engage in the world. Don't worry about it. But you know the difference between when you sport with life, when you're having fun. It's all a game. Or oh, this is serious business. I must have this, that, or the other thing. Way of the bogey, way of the yogi. Any thoughts on this? So, the demoniac caught up in more, better, different. I want my. God help anybody who gets in my way. If someone makes me angry. It's a life of more and more fear, more and more need control. Any thoughts on this? I have a question about something you asked, you said earlier about when you're meditating and there's thoughts running through your head and so you stop. Is it better under those circumstances to just sit there and let them run? Yes. What I would recommend is this. Again, there's not just one meditative practice all the time. The yogi wants to have his carpet bag of tricks is practices. So the rule of thumb is this, the grosser your mind, the more meditative supports. The subtler your mind, you drop the meditative supports away. So for you, if you had that particular issue of your mind, blah, 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 you might take up a practice called japa. Have you heard of that before? No. Japa is the silent repetition of a mantra, a short sacred word or prayer. And both in Orthodoxy and Catholicism, these are associated with prayer beads. Rosary. In the East, we have the Mala. Almost identical practice. So your idea is you focus on something, you concentrate. And as the thoughts and feelings arise, you don't suppress them, you notice them, but gently but deliberately bring your mind back to your point of attention. Your mind's a little more subtle, you don't need the mala. Or um, in many of the vipassana uh, traditions, you'll do things like focus on the breath. The cool thing about the breath is it's always there. The neat thing about your body is your body is always in the now. The body's never in the past, it's never in the future. It's always in the now. Uh, those of you who've done the Goenka Vipassana retreats who've done some of those. The meditation practice is to scan the body. 
Just become aware. And why does that work? Because your body is always in the now. You're not scanning, oh, yesterday my foot hurt. That's not the practice. It's what's going on now. And when your mind wanders, you notice it. You bring it back to the scan. Isn't that what they tell you to do? This making sense? Yes. Thank you. Now, if your mind has gotten to the point where it's really quiet, <clears throat> then you can drop those meditative supports. If your mind is quieter than the mantra, drop the mantra. If your mind is quieter than the scan, drop the scan. your mind is really subtle, you can begin what we call Atma Vichara, inquiry into the self. Who am I? What's my essential nature? In the space between your thoughts, you got to be able to get your thoughts slowed down enough so you can see the space between your thoughts. Be attentive faculty introverted. See if you can notice. What's your essential nature? That's a practice that's most effective in a very quiet mind. But you can see it depends on, and same person. On Monday, I can have a very noisy mind, and Tuesday, it's quiet. Or in the same meditative period, I have, may have moments of profound silence. And all of a sudden, some lump of gunk comes up. That's fine. Just don't judge it. Is that useful? Yes. Any other questions on that? <laughs> Good questions. Oh, let's see how we do. Next verse. Chinta mapari me yam cha kalayanta sukta mupashrita ha kamo pabhoga parama eta viditi nishchita ha. Giving themselves over to immeasurable cares, ending only with death, regarding gratification of lust as their highest aim, and feeling sure that this is all that matters. So, only the Egyptians get to take a U-Haul to the Great One. The rest of us leave it all behind. That's a joke. They don't really get to do it. Come into this world stark naked. Nothing. And we leave it the same way. So the foolish person devotes his attention and time and energy into amassing wealth and power and prestige, satisfy the ego. Let me fulfill my desires. What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? Gimme, 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 gimme. The yogi wants moksha, liberation. Are you free? Different values. Next one. <clears throat> Do you have enough light? Sorry? Do you have enough light? Yeah. Uh, 
now it's better. Can you turn the, there's a cord right next to Krishna there. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Pasha, Pasha, the Pervar Buddha, Buddha, Kama Krodha Parayana, Ehante Kama Bogartha, Mannaya, Mannaye Nartha, Sajayan. Bound by a hundred ties of hope, given to lust and anger. They do strive to obtain by unlawful deeds hordes of wealth for sensual enjoyments. So, the more we are committed to this way of life, that getting what I want will make me happy, the end result is more desire. And again, the, the classic example of this is if we know people or ourselves have ever dealt with addiction or alcoholism or abuse. The more you get, the more you want. One is too many and a thousand is not enough. How do I get out? And those of us, if we have loved ones or friends who've been caught in the syndrome of addiction, we see that in the end, all ethical fiber goes by the wayside. We're willing to use and abuse people, lie, cheat, and steal in order to feed the beast. Now, that's just a socially unacceptable form of much of the whole human condition. People do it in business. People do it in the sewing circle. Come. Very nice people. In order to satisfy this karma, this craving. Going on. Kita madhya maya labdha 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 mimam prapya se manoradhama. This has to today been gained by me. This desire I shall obtain. This is mine. And this wealth shall also be mine in the future. So here he has the description of the internal state of the person caught up in the syndrome of egoism, of I-ness and minus. This is what my mind says to me. So let's parse these, these ideas. What's the first one again, please, in English? This has, to, this has today been gained by me. Yes. So that's pride and arrogance. Look what I've accomplished. All rooted in the idea that I am the doer. You need to let everybody know. Now, that doesn't mean you don't put your accomplishments on your CV when you're applying for a job. We're not talking about that. About what goes on inside my mind. I'm okay because I've done it. Next idea, this desire I shall obtain. Yes. What's the next thing for me? I'll be happy if I get the bigger car, the bigger house. Get more bitcoins out there. <laughs> okay. I, I can, I'm gonna go skiing in the Alps. 
if I can tell my friends, oh, yes, let me see. <laughs> Wait a minute, there's no snow in the Alps anymore. Oh. So we project into the future and be happy when I accomplish these things. Very interesting. I have a very dear friend. And when I first met him many, many years ago, he was a pizza driver. And he decided that he wanted to go to school. So he left his job as a pizza driver, went to a city college, got an associate's degree, then went to San Francisco State, got his bachelor's. Then went on at San Francisco State, got a master's, and we started to teach, taught communications back at City College. I've arrived. This is about time. Then he got dissatisfied. So then he went and got an EDD, a doctorate of education from USF. Very good school. Now he's doc. So and so. And now all of a sudden he's a little disappointed that they're not rushing to hand in tenure track jobs. And he got all these things that he wanted and it didn't do it. He thought this was just going to blow his socks on. There's a marvelous story. Do any of you know who Luciano Pavarotti was? A great tenor. So his goal in life was to be the world's greatest tenor. And then he got it. And he went into this deep depression because it didn't do what he thought it would do. There's a marvelous story. He talks about this. Well, he's no longer with us, but he did talk about it. He was flying into the Milan airport in winter and there was ice on the runway and the plane he was on skidded off the runway and crashed, the plane broke into two. And some people died. And there he was helping fellow passengers off the plane. So we had this rush with death. From that moment on, everything about him changed. And he began to live a life of gratitude and service. One of the things he did, any of you ever remember the three tenors? Jose Carreras, Placido Domingo, and Luciano Pavarotti. What a lot of people don't know is many years prior to that, Jose Carreras had gotten leukemia. And thank God he went through the treatment, he was cured, he was in remission, but his strength was shattered. He could not sing an operatic role anymore, and he was broke. So Pavarotti put together the three tenors as a way for Carreras to make a living. He was deeply involved in music education, setting up all sorts of things. His whole focus changed from my accomplishments, I'm going to be the best, to how can I serve? How can I be grateful for the gifts that I've got? And you still perform. You became a very different person because of this. So many of us can suffer under the delusion. The reason I'm unhappy is I've just not yet gotten the brass ring. But people who got Get what you want, get what you want. That 
doesn't make a person Then you can divorce your wife, get the sports car, and get uh, a trophy husband or a trophy wife. If that's what it is. To fix this God shaped hole in our hearts. Again, back to our old friend, St. Augustine. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. For those of us who are at white, until we develop the trick of what we call Atmarana, you can ravel in the self you have what the Sufis call the taste. <laughs> this. That alone satisfies the world. <clears throat> so those who don't know that may run in the idea that, well, just Around the next bed, then I'll be happy. It's the next idea. This is mine. Oh, and, and this belt shall also be mine in the future. Yeah. So hoarding, greed, possessiveness, wanting more, more, more. Again, I can remember what would our dear friend Donald Trump said at one time, I'm a greedy man, I'm a greedy man. And what Krishna says, no one is more fearful than a wealthy man. Maybe losing. Yes. Now, wealth in and of itself is not problematic. But if you're a businessman, one of the things if you want to have peace, you got to be willing to lose stuff. It's all a risk. What's the next idea? That's it. That's all it. Right. That's the last this is a good place to stop. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Purnamama Hari Om So your assignment is to pay attention to your mind. See when you are caught up in the syndrome of the body. May not be able to stop, no blame. Shankara says, at least don't embrace a rotting corpse thinking it's a beautiful bride. At least know that the cause of my suffering is mama craving. Spreha, longing. I have an addictive relationship with something in the world. I want it my way. And do our best to go. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Bye, Jim. Ciao, Bello.